Hi everyone, thanks for coming uh, and welcome at uh, a talk on simulating a freezing society, Oops, building the AI of Frostpunk. So my name is Maciej Czerwonka and I'm gameplay programmer at 11-bit studios. During the Frostpunk development I was leading simulation team, which was responsible for creating a society in Frostpunk. And apart from that, I'm a game developer for 15 years now. I work for companies like CD Projekt Red. I also run my own indie game development studio, but uh, it wasn't a very huge success. So, And if you want, you can uh, catch me on Twitter. So as I said earlier, uh, I'm working in 11-bit studios. Uh, in 11-bit studios, we're trying to create and deliver games which are, meaning, which are meant to be meaningful. What do we mean by that? <clears throat> we want our games to ask difficult questions. We want to help players to know themselves better. We want our games to touch real-world problems. We want to deliver more than just entertainment. And by the way, we're hiring. So if you want, you can talk to me after the talk or during the conference. So what I'm going to talk about? I'm going to talk about Frostpunk. For those of you who haven't played the game, I'm going to move forward to tell you how did we build the society of Frostpunk using the AI building blocks. And I have a few slides on performance as well. Let's start from Frostpunk. Frostpunk is a spiritual successor of our previous game, This War of Mine, <coughs> and it's a survival city building game about what a society is uh, ready to do and push to the limits. So, as you can see, it's built on three main, main pillars. It's a city building game, it's a survival, and there is a society component as well. As for the first two, which are well defined, the society component is not. So, uh, how do we implement a society in, in a game? When we started the development of Frostpunk, we had no idea. So, we came up with the idea of creating a living city, which is supposed to be reliable, which is supposed to be fun to interact with, and which is capable of telling a story. And how do we do that? We thought that starting with a simulation would be a good idea, so we took a citizen and said, hey, we want you to do things. But how do we make a citizen do things we want him, uh, we want, uh, him to do? <clears throat> we thought that uh, equipping him with basic needs is enough. So we added needs like, I'm hungry, or I want to sleep, or I need to go to work, and that should do it. So, Let's try to tell a story of a citizen of Frostpunk. Uh, to tell a story, you need, uh, like in a sentence, you need components like a subject, verb, and an object. So I'll try to mimic our simulation with the components of a sentence and answer a question, what's the subject in our simulation, what's a verb, and what's an object? Starting from a subject. Uh, Subject in our simulation is an agent, meaning a citizen of our city. Be it a male or a female, be it a child or an adult, be it a human or a machine, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's an inhabitant of a city who will perform actions and be a part of simulation. So if you take a closer look, we build our agent, uh, we compose our agent of three components. It has a state, a perception, and a decision tree, and it also interacts with so-called environment. By environment, I understand everything which is around the agent and influence its state. And example of environment can be temperature level or time of day or distance to house or distance to work, for example. Uh, Let's uh, take a closer look at each of the components. State of the agent can be thought as its memory and its needs. The important thing is that it's a private set of data, which is exposed only to agent decision tree and can be mutated only by a decision tree. Uh, the perception component can be thought of eyes and ears of the agent. 
meaning it's a translation layer between the environment and the decision tree. So every signal which comes to the agent is first being translated by the perception to before it goes to a decision tree. And the last component, a decision tree, can be thought of as agent brain. And it has access to the state and the perception and can mutate the state, as I said before. It was implemented as a behavior tree. And uh, you can think of the decision tree as of a mechanism which answers the question, what should I do now? The important part is what. All right, so let's move forward. We have a subject. Now uh, let's talk about verb. Uh, we came up with this idea of an abstraction called activity. And activity is a verb in our, our simulation. But uh, we also have an abstraction called an action. So what's the distinction between activity and an action? Activity is, uh, you can think of activity as of a state in which agent is currently in, as opposed to an action. Action is a thing which the agent is currently doing. I'll give you an example. For example, working uh, at the coal mine and using a pickaxe uh, are two different things. Activity would be working at a coal mine and using a, using a pickaxe would be an action in our approach. So activity is not atomic and it's not an action. So let's see, uh, let's take a closer look at the components. The first component of activity is activity tree, which can be thought of as action factory because it produces actions for agents. It's implemented as behavior tree as well, but one thing which is different from the, the decision tree is that the activity uh, accepts multiple agents because activities were supposed to handle multi-agent scenarios. Okay, let's move forward. I won't go into detail uh, in target selector, but for now uh, we can think of it of, as a function which matches agents to the activities. Uh, I'll get back to target selectors later. And we have a priority, which is a symbol number. Uh, we need a priority because we need activities to be ordered. The system needs to know what activity is, which activity is more important than the other. So we invented this number uh, and set us designers to type the numbers for each activities. And it turned out that when we reached like 30 or 40 activities, uh, maintaining the order and man maintaining the list of activities was a nightmare. So we replaced the priority with activity list. So now we have an activity list and it's transparent. Uh, the order is visible. When you look at the list, you uh, see the order in the first place. And it's very cheap in terms of maintenance. All right, so how does the activity affect our agent? As you can see, the state was equipped with a new property called preferences, and it's a set of, it's a collection of activities. But why do agent need this, needs this collection? Because the agent needs to inform the system somehow about activities it is interested in this very moment, in performing in this very moment. <coughs> so whenever an agent wants to do something, wants to be in a particular state, it adds an activity to its preferences. So that system knows that the agent is interested in something. And the important thing also as well is that the preferences here uh, are the agent decision. No one can set the preferences for agent. Except for one thing, because we have activities called fallback activities, which are activities we always add to the collection. Uh, it doesn't matter what the agent adds to the activity uh, collection, to the preferences, we always add fallback activities. An example of fallback activities is death, for example. Each agent of, in our game always prefer death activity. All right, we have a subject and a verb. Oh, no, not yet. Uh, another com new component in the agent is an action I talked about earlier. Action is an abstraction uh, which controls the agent state and visuals, and uh, it's more atomic than an activity. An action comes from a plan, which is a simple collection of actions. Uh, it's fed by activity tree and consumed by agent when current action is finished. 
So we have a subject and a verb. Let's talk about object. Uh, we developed uh, another abstraction called point of interest. And point of interest has this one cool feature that it has abbreviation, which is short and pronounceable. So uh, whenever I say POI in the rest of the presentation, I'm referring to a point of interest. <coughs> and uh, point of interest can be thought of as an abstraction which is attached to a physical object in game, to a building or to a place or to another landmark where agent can go and perform activities there. So as an example, we have a building called prison in game, which has two points of interest. One of them is point of interest with activity prison guard, and the other is uh, point of interest with activity prisoner. So that's the idea behind point of interest. So let's take a look at the components of point of interest. Each point of interest declares an activity, which is available here for the agent. Another component is conditions. We have in our game um, an expression system. I won't go into detail of expression system because out of the scope of this presentation, but the things uh, which, which I'll argue to know now for now is that expressions uh, can be defined by designers and they evaluate to a Boolean value. And this Boolean value can mean a lot of things. In this particular case, they decide if point of interest is active or not. We have point of interests which uh, are supposed to be active only during the day or during the night or during some other uh, uh, or, or f f when other conditions are met. And the last thing in point of interest is space. Space is a simple range to numbers minimum and maximum and it decides how many agents can perform activity here. The important thing is here that if we define a minimum to a number more uh, larger or equal to two, it means then whenever uh, a single agent comes to perform an activity in this particular POI, uh, it will not be allowed to do so because we set a minimum to two. So the activity is able to start only when minimum two agent appears. All right, so how does the point of interest affect our agent? As we can see, the agent state was equipped with a target, which is a POI. And the uh, important thing is that agents always have target. There are no moments in our game where, when agents don't have target. Even idle agents have target, and dead agents have target as well. OK, so we have a subject which is our agent, we have a verb, which is our activity, and we have uh, an object, which is our point of interest. We have an environment which interacts with our agents. That's how the overview of our sentence looks like. So we have a model. Let's assume we get this model and apply it on our simulation to see if we're good. What happens? Doctors leave their patients to build a road. Mm, okay, children fight in fight club. Mm. Hunters return from three-day expedition to get a snack. And guards join the protest they were supposed to disperse. Prison workers leave their work to bury the dead, letting convicts escape. Well, not cool, it's not what we expected. So what do we do about it? We need to distinguish agents somehow. We need to be able to tell the system that some agents are not able to perform activities in some points of interest. How do we do it? We have our agents. And at first sight, we can tell a lot of things about them. Uh, the most important thing is that they differ between each other. I mean, they're different. So why not uh, think of something like labels? For example, the first guy, we can tell that he's an engineer, the lady is a worker, the little guy here is a child, and so on and so on. We can have those labels, put them on those agents to let the system know who they really are. Okay, so having said that, we have, a, we have labels, we have introduced another abstraction. How does it affect our agent? We have a new field here called features, which is a collection of labels. 
And label in our implementation is just a string. It's a designer imagination, what's the limit here? Designer can type anything and put a label on an agent so that the system knows who this person is. But feature collection is not enough. We need to tell the point of interest that particular agents are not allowed or allowed in the point of interest. So if you remember, we had a space component in point of interest. We add two collections to the space component. We add required collection and prohibited collection. Both are collections of labels and decide if, if an agent is allowed or not allowed to join the activity in this point of interest. And one more thing which changes here, instead of one space we had before, now we have a collection of spaces. So this is now a collection of spaces. All right, so we have model. What do we do next? We need to assign our agents to our poise. How do we do it? We have, uh, on, on this slide, we have labels, agents on the left. Uh, each rectangle is an agent. Each uh, small rectangle here, square here, is, in, is his preferences, which are activities. Small circles here are, are labels. And on the right side of the slide, we have points of interest uh, with colors uh, which represents their activity types. They have spaces inside. Each space has slots for agents and requirement labels. Some slots are colored, meaning they are occupied by agents who are already inside. And some borders of some slots are red, meaning we have defined a minimum here. So there are lots of data. How do we tackle the, this problem? Fortunately, there is a thing called assignment problem. Uh, which is a very well-defined combinatorial optimization problem, which uh, in a nutshell can be described as a problem which is about assigning workers to jobs uh, with the goal to minimize the cost of the assignment. So, yeah, and there was this American mathematician, Harold Kuhn, who in the 50s developed an algorithm called Hungarian algorithm, which solves this problem. And his work was based on work of two Hungarian mathematicians, but I, I'm not brave enough to pronounce their names because I would butcher the pronunciation anyway. So, but the algorithm is fairly easy to understand. And we have our own implementation, which is based on top coder article. So if you just type Hungarian algorithm top coder in Google, the first uh, match will be, will be the article. And I strongly recommend reading it if you, if you want to ever tackle assignment problem. Uh, if you want to implement your own uh, Hungarian algorithm to solve assignment problems. All right, so let's see an example. What is an assignment problem? I believe that most of you know exactly what it is, but for those of you who don't, assignment problem, uh, imagine we have four programmers, Anna, Jan, Adela, and Jakub, and we have four programming problems related to pathfinding, streaming, interface, and networking. And we also know the, times, the time each programmer needs to accomplish a task. For example, Adela in this particular example needs five hours to finish the interface task. So we create this matrix, we push it to Hungarian Solver, and what we get is this. Hungarian Solver tells us that we need to give Adela pathfinding task, we need to give Jan streaming task, we need to give Anna interface task, and Jakub networking task. And that's the optimal solution of the problem. All right, but how does it map to our situation? Because apart from uh, agents and jobs, and costs. We also have things like activities, labels, occupied slots, minimums, spaces, a lot, a lot more data. First thing we need to ask ourselves is what's our cost function? For the assignment problem example, our cost function was the time that each programmer needed to accomplish a task. Um, it's not very useful in our case 
because we're not programming anything. Uh, so, well, intuition tells me that when I have a citizen who wants to go somewhere to do something, we can measure a distance between the citizen and the place and give Hungarian solver the distance. So why not try starting with the distance? Okay, let's assume we're starting with the distance. What next? Uh, the problem here is still that we have too much data to think about them. So let's uh, use the approach uh, divide and conquer and get rid of some, simplify the problem, get rid of some data. Let's process one activity at a time. So I picked the brown activity and let's see what happened. We only have five agents left. Uh, all of them has brown activity in their preferences list and we only have three points of interest. All of them are brown. It looks, it looks simpler, less data. Cool. Uh, what's our next problem? Our next problem is occupied slots. We have an agent here who is doing something and we need to assign those guys. What do we do with him? Well, the answer is it depends because there are activities which don't bother about this guy. For example, when this guy is constructing a building, we don't want to do anything with him. We just want to assign more agents to him so to speed up the construction. We don't want to kick him out from this boy. Uh, we just want to let him finish the construction. But there are other cases. For example, medical treatment. When we have a guy who is slightly ill here, and we have a guy who is gravely ill here, and he's going to die in like two hours, we want to consider kicking this, kicking this guy out and letting this guy uh, move in the, in the spot which was freed. So uh, given, uh, assuming we're using the second use case I just described, uh, we're going with kicking, kicking him out option. And we're calling this rebalancing. So we kicked the guy out, all of our points of interest are empty now, and we have one more agent on our left side of the slide. Okay, we have uh, occupied slots solved. So uh, what's our ne next problem? Our next problem is that some of the agents have labels. I mean, all of the agents have labels, but some of the slots have requirements. For example, this slot has a requirement on yellow label, but only two agents, has, uh, two agents have the yellow label. So if we push those data to our Hungarian solver, it doesn't know nothing about our labels, about our requirements. It would just assign by distance uh, our agents to our poise. So how do we tell it that he, it shouldn't assign our labels, our agents to, uh, to spaces with label requirements, not breaking the label requirements? Well, we introduce, uh, we tell him that, hey, whenever you want to assign this guy, this guy or this guy or this guy to this slot, know that the assignment cost is huge. So if you're trying to put this guy here, you will pay more than assigning him elsewhere. And we call this cost, which is huge, invalid assignment cost. So that uh, Hungarian solver won't try to assign our agents breaking the label requirements. But it's still not enough because when assignments, assignment solver, Hungarian solver uh, runs out of free slots, he will anyway assign, it will anyway assign our agents to our spaces with uh, requirements, breaking the, the requirement label rule, so that we need to introduce a special point of interest, uh, which has two features. One of them is it has a lot of slots, like we can think of it as it has infinite slots, and the other is that assigning anyone to this boy costs are a huge number, meaning invalid assignment cost minus one. So that whenever assignment solver or Hungarian solver wants to assign an agent to a space with a label requirement, breaking the requirement, it will instead assign the agent to our 
invalid assignment POI. Uh, this way we are able to intercept those agents who were otherwise be assigned, breaking the label requirement. Okay, so what's next? Next we have a, we need to satisfy the minima. As you can see, this point of interest has a minima, minimum defined. It needs at least two agent, agents to start activity. So how do we, our, of course our Hungarian solver doesn't know a thing about our minimum system. So how do we address this issue? Uh, well, we developed a few steps algorithm. I won't go into detail here, I'll just show you an example. <coughs> So first thing is we execute our Hungarian algorithm and it assigns agents uh, to our POIs. So three guys landed here, two landed here, one landed here. We, as we can see, uh, we, we are breaking the minimum, minimum here. So we didn't supply as many agents as needed to this POI. What do we do? We get rid of this POI and the agent gets back to the list. Uh, okay, then the next step is sorting the POI spaces by level of saturation. So we have three out of four slots occupied here, we have two out of three slots occupied here, and we have zero out of one slots occupied here. So we number them one, two, three. And the last step would be saturate the spaces uh, related to the order. So we take this guy who was dropped from this boy and assign him here. And that's our result. So as you can see, we didn't assign anyone here, but we didn't break the minima as well. It was not our purpose to assign anyone here. It was our purpose not to break the, the POI minimum, the space minimum. OK. so we. We call this entire process targeting because it's about determining a target for a citizen. And important thing about targeting is that it's a centralized process. It's not an agent decision to find a target for himself. Target, a citizen cannot tell a system, hey, I want this target. No, it's the system who decides about what target will be assigned to a particular citizen. The only thing that citizen can do is to tell the system about the preferences it has, about the activities it is currently preferring, and the system has full visibility of the agents of the POIs in the game and decides who goes where. Uh, things we did in targeting is we approached with the divide and conquer rules, so to simplify a problem we process one activity at a time, we process all the agents at a time. We process all the POIs at a time. We have this mechanism of kicking the agents out whenever we, uh, we think it's needed. We call it rebalancing. And we have the algorithm to satisfy POI minima. So two interesting things here is also that kicking an agent is also a targeting. We have a fallback activity called default, and whenever we decide to kick an agent, it is just retarget to a default activity. And agent death is also targeting. As you remember, all our agents always prefer activity death. All right, so we have a model and we have a targeting. Are we good? Let's see. People change houses every day. Families do not stay together. People change work every day. Very dynamic society. Patients who are almost cured get kicked out of medical posts. And why does it happen? because it turns out that distance is not a universal cost descriptor. So we're getting back to target selector I mentioned earlier when I was talking about activity. And if you remember, target selector was uh, described as a function which matches agents and poise. And now we want an activity 
to have a specific target selector to override the default behavior of target selector. And target selector should define its own cost function, which does not need to rely on a distance. And target selector should have a knowledge if it wants rebalancing or not. It should be transparent for targeting. So a targeting should look like, hey, I have the agents, I have the boys, do something with them. We give them to target selector, and target selector do magic, and gives us pairs of agents and poise, matches of agents and poise. If you look at the example, we're updating two activities here, activity one and activity two. And in both cases, we have agent and poi collections, which comes to target selector. It does magic, and it returns matches between agents and poise. So this agent goes here, this agent goes here, this poi remains unassigned, this agent goes here. So we have around 15 target selectors in game, 15 different types of target selectors. Let's see a few examples. One of the simplest target selector is nearest target selector. Its cost descriptor is distance. It has no rebalancing and it's used for construction. So whenever you're constructing a road or a building in Frostpunk, this target selector assigns the agent to, to the job. We have persistent assignments target selector and its cost descriptor is assignment. And what do I need, mean by that? Whenever you hire someone to do a job, for example, in a coal mine, and you click this plus button telling someone, hey, come here to, to extract coal from a mine, an agent is chosen, and so-called assignment, persistent assignment is created between the agent and, and the workplace, the POI in the workplace. And whenever target selector gets the agent and the POI, it checks if it has an assignment. If it does, its cost to this point of interest is very low. And if it doesn't, it's, it's higher. It doesn't use rebalancing, and we use it for work. And one of the more complex target selectors example is medical treatment. Its cost descriptor is generally distance, but we heal the almost cured in the first place. And we prefer patients who are gravely ill to those who are slightly ill. It uses rebalancing, and we use it for healing. So does it work? Let's see. Mass protests are attended by three people, like in real life, right? Uh, convict decides not to show up on his execution. Idle citizens just stand there doing nothing. And production output is unpredictable. So living city still miss, misses rela reliability. What do we do with it? Smoke and mirrors. We start cheating. From now on, we're not playing with simulation. With, we're starting to cheat. How do we cheat? Uh, first thing, we introduce idle behaviors. Because there's no such thing as doing nothing. You always do something. Whenever a citizen is not driven by simulation, meaning it's not satisfying its needs, it's not working, it's not sleeping, it doesn't mean it does nothing. It does something. And player who watch citizens just standing has this feeling of, hey, why they're just standing there? They have free time. They should do something. That's why we introduce idle behavior. And we have plenty of idle behaviors in game. For example, for example in this uh, scenario, we have adults who go to work because it's morning, and children who are not sent to work by player yet, uh, have their free time playing next to the generator. So they're jumping, they clap their hands. And from the simulation point of view, they do nothing. But it doesn't matter. It matters for the player that this behavior is here because it improves reliability. All right, the next thing is we introduce directed scenes. I'll show you on an example. We have an execution scene here, and everything you can see on this movie is fake. The scene was pre-rendered, 
none of the citizens you can see on this movie is a part of a simulation. All those people are pre-rendered, put there only for simulation reason. Only this, this guy and this guy are part of simulation. They're here by accident, but all the rest is, is just a directed scene, which will disappear on a black screen. And another thing is independent economy, because during the development of Frostpunk, we struggled with economy, meaning with stable production output. Our game is a survival city builder. We need to deliver an economy which is stable. So if we say that a coal mine extracts 100 tons of coal a week, or, yeah, or any number, we need to deliver this 100 tons of coal a week. Uh, and our agents, of course, driven by simulation, sometimes were late for work, sometimes went out for a snack, sometimes did something else, so the economy production output was crippled heavily. We were trying to address this issue by waking them up earlier, for, for example, and sending them to work, and, and it turned out that sometimes they were at work too early, waiting for the workplace to open and freezing to death, dying there, so it wasn't uh, a way to tackle this issue. So uh, like five months before the release, we decided to make the economy completely independent from simulation. So uh, on this example, you can see we have a steel wreckage and I'm hiring 15 people to extract steel from there. And they start to go. They're somewhere here under the UI. Oh, here's the first guy. And if you can see the steel indicator in the UI, it is the steel count is growing because they already extract the steel when moving towards their workplace. It'll take them three hours, three game hours to get there. And during that time, they will extract a lot of steel, even though they're not at their workplace. So yeah, the production uh, output was, is, uh, equal to what we say here. Okay, and the last few slides I have is about performance, about techniques we used uh, when optimizing this system. First thing is we're using event-driven behavior trees. As, you, uh, as most of you probably know how behavior trees works, the uh, main difference between event-driven behavior trees and regular behavior trees is that in event-driven approach, we evaluate the tree only when an event is propagated to a tree. So from time, from time to time, when the state changes, a tree gets an event, and we evaluate all the sub-tree of a so-called event handler. We have a special node called event handler. We have three event handlers here. We have on-enter, on-target changed, and on-exit. And when, for example, event on enter is being propagated to a tree, we execute the whole subtree under the on enter. It saves time because we have pretty large behavior trees. We have like 150 behavior trees right now. And uh, for a lot of citizens, uh, it's pretty time consuming to have uh, runtime driven behavior trees rather than event driven. Okay, next thing is budgeting and distributed update. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, when we were talking about, when I was talking about targeting, I, t I told you that uh, we can process one activity at a time, but there's another question. How many activities do we process during a single frame? Uh, it's an interesting question because intuition tells me that why not process all of them? And yeah, that's, that was the first approach. And uh, it turned out that we have, sometimes we have uh, very long update times. So we decided to introduce budgeting. What's the budgeting? We say to ourselves that, hey, we have four milliseconds per game frame to allocate into targeting, for example. And when we reach four milliseconds, we break the uh, processing and we continue from this moment in the next frame. So in this example, we can see that in this frame, we process like one, two, three, four, five, six activities. 
and we reached our budget, so we stop. And in the next frame, we continue from this place, and we process the rest of activities, and we reach our budget here, so we stop. And in the next frame, we continue with the rest of activities. And here, the so-called big update ends, and we can start from the beginning. The next thing is parallel targeting. We have some target selectors which are pretty heavy, especially for a large number of agents. So we can decide then that some activities will be targeted, will be processed on a worker thread. So we have a game thread here and a worker thread here. And when we reach our activity, we schedule all the data needed for targeting to a worker thread. Uh, and from now on, we're waiting. In frame number two, we do nothing because the results are not ready yet. And in frame number three, we grab the results and move forward to the next activity. And the last thing I have uh, on performance is limiting number of processed entities. So on one of the previous slides, I told you that we're updating all the agents at the time and all the activities at the time, but it's pretty heavy approach uh, when we do that, especially when we have like 900, <coughs> 900 of agents and like a thousand of points of interest. So we decided to update only dirty agents. What do I mean by dirty? Dirty uh, agent gets dirty when its preferences change since last update. And the same thing for POIs. We update only dirty POIs, and dirty POIs are POI is dirty whenever its state changed, changes since last update. But it's not possible with rebalancing. With rebalancing, we need to update all the agents because the guy who is occupying a slot from which we want to kick him out may not be dirty. OK, so. That's it for the performance, and what did we learn during the process? From the very beginning of development, we focused too much on simulation while we were trying to achieve reliable living city and stable economy, which is crucial for a city-building survival game. So we wanted to craft the experience, not the simulation, we wanted the player to believe that what he or she sees is populated with people who behave in a reliable manner. We wanted stable economy, which is core system for a city builder survival game. And doing this by, by parametrizing simulation is hard. I mean, it's not undoable, but it's hard. So, yeah, whenever you're, you will have a you have a game, imagine you have a game with simulation, driven by simulation, and you want to tackle a problem, problem. Think twice if parametrizing simulation is a way to go, if it's not too costly. Uh, if you have resources to do so, because it's very time consuming. And things can happen during the process. Having said that, we should have not put most of our effort into simulation. We should have focused more on player perception of the living city. And I, want, I don't want to say that the system that we developed is wrong approach, because this system, for example, now after the release, release of the game, uh, gives us a lot of flexibility and extensibility, because we created two add-ons for the game already using the system, not changing it at all. So it works for us at the moment, but when we were, uh, when we were in the uh, last stages of development, we had a lot of problems with the simulation, trying to achieve goals by parametrizing simulation, which was not a way to go. The cheating, uh, if we introduced cheating earlier, it would save us a lot of time and resources. OK, so that's it. Hey, OK, thank you for your presentation. And do we have any questions here?
Uh, I, I would like to ask uh, about the uh, complexity of uh, tools you used uh, to edit these uh, models, uh, whether these were just uh, script files or you had some editors for behavior trees, etc. Uh, you're asking about um, the point of interest, activity, and agent like definitions. Uh, yeah, we have a tool which is uh, working on XML files or our, our definition files, our text XML files, and we build a, an editor uh, which works on those XML files and can visualize uh, the XML files like a property grid. So we're using sort of property grid to, yeah, to create and modify all the definitions. And XML files, file, uh, I mean, text file is good for things like Solve, resolving merge conflicts and etc. So, yeah. Very cool presentation. Thank you. Um, do you uh, tie the art that is in the game? I haven't played it yet. Uh, to a simulation, for example. Uh, and how much of that are you doing? For example, ill people start looking differently. I don't know, they start coughing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, uh, we have an appearance system in game which is based on the labels I described before. So appearance system is a special kind of mechanism which can uh, affect how the citizen looks like. So. We have, for example, disabled people who don't have a leg or an arm, and the appearance system is able to alter the model, the animation, the things how, how a person looks like. So yeah, it, the, the case you uh, asked about is handled by, by the appearance system based on the labels, so on the same data set we use in our simulation. Thanks for the presentation. I would like to ask about the QA of the, uh, of the final game. Since it's a simulation, there's a lot of undeterministic uh, situations that can happen. How did you make sure that it can work in all possible outcomes of the game? Thanks. Thanks for the question. It's a very good question. And we, we didn't know how to tackle it, because it was the first game we created simulation for. And during the development process, we developed 250 test scenarios for our QA department, so that every major release, even internal release, needs to have passed the, all the test scenarios before we can say that we're ready for this, with this game to, you know, to move forward. So we were using test scenarios, and our QA department were just you know, testing step by step each art test scenario and giving a red or green light if the build is okay or not. Hi, great game. Uh, do you regret not being able to put, push the simulation all the way uh, into the economy? Because like my initial impression was Exactly as you showed that those people are still not there. It's a pity that I already see some progress. I'm not sure I heard the uh, entire question. You, do, do you regret uh, the decision at the, at the end to not do the economy through simulation, but uh, doing separating it so you can get the economic simulation correct and not base it on uh, the AI, like those people walking and already achieving resources? Um, so the question was, do we regret the decision that we started cheating at the end? Uh, yeah, like if you think that, uh, if you were thinking how the game would have looked like if you did everything through AI, all the economy. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem was that we didn't know how to parameterize the simulation to achieve our goal. It was hard. We didn't know a knowledge at that time. Now, after the game release, we know there are techniques to 
For example, uh, if you're strong in machine learning and data science, there are techniques uh, which are related to hyperparameter tuning or uh, genetic algorithms which can help you with that. We didn't know that when we were developing the game. So uh, we weren't able to finish using just a simulation because the designer expectations, we couldn't meet the designer expectations. Like we needed to have a mass protest which was supposed to be attended by like 90% of the population of the city. And uh, all the time there was like 15 people or 10 people or everyone else had someone more interesting to do. So the designers were pushing, pushing us uh, to deliver you know, the, the requirements. So we decided that we had to do it because the simulation was not an option. So it wasn't a matter of, uh, you know, regretting. It was a matter of uh, we have to do it because otherwise we're not able to, you know, provide that simulation gives us the results we want. So we have time for maybe last question or two questions. There is one question here in the front and the other one here. So hi, you described like few American behaviors which were basically bugs. Uh, is there any of those behaviors uh, which uh, been kept in the final game? Like you are like, wow, what's happening? Let's keep it there. Well, I heard about one yesterday when talking to someone from the conference. He told me that when he played Frostpunk, uh, people from his city just left the city and entered the wall and never came back. So yeah, there were bugs, uh, we're trying to fix them. Uh, there were a few patches fixing bugs so far, so yeah. Okay, and the other question was here, over there to the right. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are 150 uh, behavior trees in the game. Uh, do all the characters use the same behavior trees or what are differences between the behavior trees across uh, the agents in the game mm -hmm. if, if they differ? Yes, um, we have two types of decision of behavior trees. One of them is decision tree, which is a tree which answers the question, what do I do? And the other is activity tree, which answers the question, how do I do it? So in terms of activities, we have like 100, 200, maybe 200 uh, behavior trees, and in terms of decision trees, we have 150. And uh, the agent is free to switch between decision trees whenever it wants. So uh, it can be treated as a state, because it's like a combination of state machine and behavior tree, and the agent can decide, hey, I want to be in another uh, behavior tree right now. My decision tree should be this one from this moment. So it can switch. So that's the reason why we have 150 decision, decision trees for different states of the agent. And as for activity trees, they are related more to the activities, so they don't switch, but they allow multiple agents to join and to be synchronized by the activity tree to perform a multi-agent situation on a point of interest. Thank you. Uh, can you give an example of a difference between two decision trees? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, for example, a agent can be in idle decision tree. So it's next to a generator doing nothing, uh, meaning doing idle behavior. And whenever it rece receives an event that its work time has started, it decides to change decision tree to work decision tree. The reason we have this uh, split to many, many behavior trees is that not all the behavior trees uh, handles all the events because we have event-driven behavior trees. So whenever we want to handle events related to work, we are in work, dec work decision tree. Whenever we want uh, a situation where we want to handle events from, for example, Burial, we want a Burial dec decision tree and so on and so on. All right. Uh, Matthew, thank you very much uh, for your interesting talk and thank you.